Would you trust a driverless car? Well, would you? Open the front passenger door, please, Al. Open the front passenger door, please, Al. Do you read me? Al, do you read me? Affirmative, Giles. I read you. Open the front passenger door. I'm sorry, Giles. I'm afraid I can't do that. I'll go out the driver's side, then. With the steering wheel in the way, Giles. Gonna find that rather difficult. It's an important question because a lot of people are killed each year by cars and driverless cars could save lives. In 2015, according to figures from the World Health Organization, 1.2 million people were killed by cars. Now, to put that number into context, that's equivalent to 4,000 747s crashing in one year. That's 11 every single day. Figures from the US Department of Transport show that 94% of all crashes in that same year were due to human error. And it's a similar number in the EU. So if we can take humans out of that process, maybe we can reduce the number of accidents and deaths and make car travel much, much safer. But it's not easy. There are technical challenges and ethical ones too. So I went to the Royal Society in London, which is the oldest scientific institution in the world to speak to an expert from Leicester University to find out how driverless cars work, how long till they're in widespread use, and the main challenges in developing them. Oh, and we also talked about Python and how you can get involved in the sector if that's something you want to do. Let's have a look over here. Can you see that? Platform nine and three quarters. So maybe we'll catch the Hogwarts Express um, in a little while. We'll do that later. Okay, so I'm here, Piccadilly Circus. Um, if you haven't been to Piccadilly Circus, it's quite a nice part of London, actually. Let me just show you down there. And then down there. I used to live here a long time ago. Oh, look, you can just see the Houses of Parliament down at the end of that street. Anyway, that's the direction we're going. Jan Oliver Ringert and his team at the University of Leicester had an exhibition demonstrating their technology. Watch how their model car reacts when the pedestrian walks onto the track. So first the software has to make sure that it gets enough information from the sensors, from the cameras, from the lidar, from the radar to detect the pedestrian, then to realize that it is a pedestrian and that the pedestrian is going to be in front of the car very soon and then it has to take appropriate actions and that's uh, all of this together to get all these pieces right, that's, that's very challenging. But those aren't the only challenges. There's accurate lane keeping, self-localization, detection and classification of other vehicles, and the safe completion of driving tasks. It's not surprising that a recent study titled People's Attitudes to Autonomous Vehicles found most people were uncomfortable with the idea of getting in a self-driving car. Then there is the potential of the car system being hacked, the personal data that the car would be able to gather about you, and the albeit remote possibility that the car might one day, in the right conditions or wrong conditions, decide to sacrifice its occupants in order to save other road users. We'll come back to that one. Now, it's probably not surprising that artificial intelligence is playing a very large role in the development processes of a lot of the systems within a self-driving car. We basically build our software with AI components, with neural networks. Artificial neural networks enable computers to learn. They're a system of interconnected processes. Data goes in on the left, it's processed, and predictions or classifications come out on the right. The output is then compared to the expected output, and this is the error in the system. This measure is then used to tune the network to make it more accurate. This process is repeated numerous times until the network has tuned itself to be as accurate as possible at the task it's undertaking. That task might be facial or object recognition, for example. It's going to say it's a cop. 
And this is um, a CNN using TensorFlow. It's a sort of standard implementation of a convolution neural network using right. CNN, TensorFlow. Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. You know about training. Well, I think many of the advances in the recent years they have been through neural networks, and that's just because it's very, very difficult to write a concrete algorithm to detect, for example, pedestrians in an image or a video. So that's what people use the neural networks for, and they they seem to be really, uh, really good at this and, and really efficient. But AI isn't deployed only in the cars. It's also part of the development process. And that's because you can optimize the learning process and the development process for cars. You see, to make the cars safe, you have to make sure that they've encountered enough real life situations in order to reach a certain level of proficiency. But how can you ever ensure that they do enough? But how does anybody test the millions of potential driver scenarios? You know, in 2017, the general manager of Toyota suggested that using current technology, it would take 142 billion kilometers of driving to train autonomous vehicles. I mean, that's almost as far as the Oort cloud and would take 2,700 years. Take me home, Al. Jan and his team at the University of Leicester are trying to overcome this problem by using artificial intelligence. Their AI system automatically creates challenging and diverse driver scenarios that a driverless car might face. Now, the benefit of that is that it speeds up testing time, but it also ensures that the car is trained on a wider range of challenging and diverse scenarios. Once those driver scenarios have been selected, they're carried out and a computer monitors how the car reacts. So, for example, did it avoid the pedestrian? The computer then scores the car on the basis of that reaction and feeds back that score to the driver system so that the car can learn. Simple. So we're we basically looking at many, many possible alternatives at once and then uh, trying to get the best action that somehow levels out the, the possibility to decrease uh, the the possibility of um, an accident. So the car is constantly monitoring its environment using the very many different sensors that it has. And then it takes the data from those sensors and compares that data to situations that it's encountered before when it was being trained. And then it uses that to try to make the very best decisions in whatever situation it's encountering right now. One of the sensors that it uses is called LiDAR. LiDAR is a very useful 3D mapping sensor. It's like radar using pulsed laser light. And that will give it a very accurate idea of its surroundings, um, which obviously helps it navigate through those surroundings much more easily. So far, I'd say it's looking good for driverless cars, but there is a problem. Sometimes a crash is unavoidable, and then the car might have to decide um, who is harmed by the crash. I'm sorry, Giles. The car has malfunctioned. We're going to crash. I've decided to sacrifice you by driving into the wall so that we save the little girl on the pedestrian crossing. She has more potential life to this. I've calculated that it's the right thing to do. It's unfair and unethical for researchers alone to make these decisions. It has to be society at large that decides what it's comfortable with. Because these decisions will have to be made at some point. And even though these cars will save hundreds of thousands of lives a year once up and running, that's not a good enough excuse to accidentally create a system that contains a bias favoring people in these situations on the basis of race or gender or sexuality or social demographic. That cannot be allowed to happen, because an automated system deciding who lives and who dies on those factors sounds like a dystopian nightmare. MIT's created a website called The Moral Machine, where you can decide what you do in certain difficult driving situations. Um, and I'd really suggest you take a look at that. So how long until autonomous vehicles are commonplace? I asked Jan about this. Yeah, so I think that's really hard to predict, but I, I guess the way it will become normal is is simply by taking part of the research that we have right now for self-driving cars and putting it into normal cars. So we already have this emergency braking assistance in, in many um, cars. You have blind spot detectors in, in trucks and all this is basically automation that we also need for, for self-driving cars. And the way it's probably going to happen, I mean the latest Audi A8 already has a system that allows it to drive uh, on the Autobahn. 
um, always with the driver but it will probably work like this in a few years your car will ask you oh this is now the, the motorway do you want me to drive and you say okay the, the lanes are wide everybody's going the same speed it's just straight yes drive and then maybe a few years later in in, in city the, the car will tell you oh this is a smart city it has sensors everywhere it would be safe if I drive do you want me to drive and then maybe you let your car drive again and then, yeah, you're sitting in a self-driving car and, and you didn't even realize. So to go back to the original question, would I trust a driverless car? Well, when you think that they've been trained on billions of kilometers of roads, that they use the most sophisticated machine learning algorithms, that they have sensors that give them a 360 degree view of the world around them, that they have a reaction time of a few milliseconds compared to the human reaction time of hundreds of milliseconds, that they don't get angry or drunk or tired, then yes, yes, I definitely trust a driverless car, just like I trust the autopilot system on a plane when I fly. This is a very active area of research. There's a lot of money being invested in the sector. It would certainly be a very interesting place to work. So I asked Jan, what was the best way of getting involved? If you're doing, so a good way is always computer science, maybe some mathematics part. So we use lots of mathematics also in, in our work, but the researchers that are here, they are all from computer science. And we, we need people from, from all parts of computer science. So we need them to design very good algorithms. We need people that work with um, artificial intelligence, deep learning. We need people that work on the more mathematical formal sides of making sure software is safe. So there are many, many different fields and they are all combined in these autonomous vehicles. So there's not really just a, a single uh, way to go. There are many fields of application. There's also uh, human interaction and, and design. You want your, your drivers to, to feel confident in the car. So the computer has to work with them together in a, in a specific way, right? So that you also need the human factors in there. So um, I guess, the best thing would be maybe a standard computer science degree and then just go and specialize from there. If you're just in high school or you just want to experiment with it at home, there are some simple kits for buying um, model parts of self-driving cars. So the first cars that we had, we built them with Lego. We put a Raspberry Pi on top with a camera. And then um, you can't do much of the deep learning, but there are, are similar systems to Raspberry Pi. Now we have a Jetson Nano that's same size as Raspberry Pi. It's 100 pounds and it can do lots of the AI stuff because it's by NVIDIA, who basically is one of the, the main drivers of this AI technology. So there are ways where you can build your own autonomous vehicle at home and, and then just uh, program in Python or C++, whatever language you like. So you can start by working on your own projects. I've put a link to the uh, Raspberry Pi in the description and to the Jetson Nano as well. Oh yes, and the control system at the exhibition, you know, for the uh, pedestrian going in the road, that was all done with Python. Yeah, I will explain how. It creates a Wi-Fi hotspot on this chip. Um, into this Wi-Fi hotspot, The Lego computer, the EV3 Lego computer, yeah. connects to that Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh -huh. It has a Python web server running on it. Right. And then once it, once you press the button, it sends a request to the web server because this was the easiest way to work with libraries to yeah. do a connection. Um, once this gets a web server request, it checks the ultrasonic sensor, whether it's clear to go with the pedestrian, and then it sends the command to the motor, also using Python, to let the pedestrian go into the middle of the road. So, like that. I'd like to say a big thank you to Jan and his team at the University of Leicester for speaking to me and taking the time to show me around their exhibition. Um, they have a website and they're also on Twitter. Also a really big thank you to the Royal Society for arranging everything for me. Do go and check out their website. They often have really interesting scientific events on all throughout the year and they're also on Twitter. So here I am outside a very busy King's College, Cambridge, I'm doing some research for another video. But I just remembered that I forgot to say to you if you like this video, then you know what to do. Ring the bell! Ring the bell! Ring the bell!